If at all possible, if you are able, let's stand. We're going to read a couple verses this, tonight. Not a lot. Just we'll read a couple and then we'll, <clears throat> we'll, let you, we'll pray and we'll let you be seated. Brother Adrian is with us. Raise your hand, Adrian. Great to have him back. He'll be with us until the, the middle of January. Is that it? Good. He's gone for two weeks in the middle of December. Most all that time he's going to be with us. And so great to have him back. We're really proud of him, one of our guys, and just doing a great job. And... The Lord is working in his life, and then the life of a disciple he has in Laos. And so uh, pray for him about that, but we're so glad to have him with us. Make sure you go by, say hi to him, maybe take him out to eat, or let him take you out to eat, whatever works for you. But uh, we're so glad to have him back, and we're really, really, we're really, really pleased with what he's doing. He's been a tremendous help in Cambodia. Philippians chapter 4, we're going to read two verses. <clears throat> chapter 6, uh, I'm sorry, verse 6 and verse 7. We have been going... Uh, over through the book of Philippians, we only have a few lessons left. We are in Philippians uh, chapter 4. Of course, Philippians deals with one main topic, which is, oh good, no one's been listening. What is the main joy? Of course, God wants us to be joyful. And looking at some of you, you could download a little bit. That'd be great. Um, God wants us to be joyful. He wants us to have joy. And, um, and so we're looking at that, and we've been at it for several, several, several weeks Verse 6 and 7 we'll read tonight. <clears throat> Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth, passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And let's pray. Father, again, as we look tonight at the book of Philippians, we pray that you just help us again <clears throat> to see about this subject of joy and how we can maintain and receive it in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seen. You may be seated. <clears throat> One of the things, and we've talked about many over the course of the few months we've been looking the book of Philippians, I think this is our 15th lesson, our 15th message. <clears throat> One of the things that can affect our joy is a concern about the things of the future, things that are coming up, things that could happen in our life. And um, we think about it, we dwell on it. Most of those things we think about will never happen. Most of those things we dwell on will never happen. A philosopher in the 16th century, I can't pronounce his last name, but he said this. My life has been full of terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened. That's how it works, doesn't it? A poet in the 19th century named James Russell said, Let us be of good cheer, remembering that the misfortunes hardest to bear are those which never come. The Bible calls looking at the future and being concerned about it um, worry. That's what it is. It's worry. What is worry? Worry are, is the thoughts, images, and emotions that are of a negative nature in which mental attempts are made to avoid anticipated potential threats. In other words, it's what we feel inside and what we dwell on and we think about that which maybe could happen and what we're going to do to deal with it. And most of the time it never does happen. So it also could be uh, to torment ourselves with the cares or anxieties in our thoughts. You see, it's all about things that could happen, not things that will happen. That is worry. And by the way, our thoughts about what potentially could happen, what could be negative in our lives, uh, have no capability to change what's going to happen anyhow. Now, if we're thinking about something that we can fix, that's a whole different situation. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about we're worried about the, the things of life and, and this and that, and this could potentially happen, and we spend all those times, and... and, and there's nothing we can do, and our thoughts aren't going to change what happens anyhow. That is what is called <clears throat> worry, and it's a waste of time. People worry about many things. 
We worry about the future, okay? And, and by the way, let's, let's not do that. <clears throat> now, 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 I don't want to be political here, but things could have went a lot worse for us uh, a few weeks ago, okay? Um, but I'll just be honest with you. That, that, that really has no bearing on how we ought to act and be as Christians in the first place. I think we should be citizens and we ought to do what we do and, and, and vote for the best candidate, but, but to worry about the future because there's a lot of things that have already happened that aren't Christian. We're just supposed to put our focus on God. But we worry about that. And by the way, I don't listen. I could get into politics, and I and I don't listen to that nonsense. But as the as the as the election was coming, I listened for a couple days, and then I, I listened on Tuesday night, and then I watched it on Tuesday night when I got home, and then I'm like, well, let me just see what everybody else. And I and I listened the next day, and I'm like, stop, because they already start the spin doctors are already. It's like I'm not going to get caught up in all of that. Now, I'm going to be a good citizen. I'm going to know what I need to know and all of that. But, but you could get so caught up in it and in the future, and you're wasting a lot of mental energy that's not going to change anything anyhow. Some people worry about their health. <clears throat> By the way, if you're worried about your health, do what you can to change it. But, but there are some things in our health that we can change with exercise and diet, this and that. But you know there's one thing you can't change in your health? That's your DNA. God gave, God gave you that and, and something, you know, you know how it is. Uh, all of a sudden you feel a little twinge in your toe and you have toe cancer, right? You know, you feel something, it's like, oh, no, heart attack's coming, right? I, if you're like me, someone starts talking about some operation they had, right? And, and it's like, oh, I had a hernia, hernia surgery. My stomach starts to hurt. I'm like, oh, no, no, don't talk. Yeah, they ripped me open right here. It's like, oh, don't tell me that because that's where I have pain right now. But we worry about all of that. Do what we're supposed to do with health and, and, and the future, but let's not worry. We worry about our family. How is this going to happen with my children and all that? I don't know. Let's just do what we're supposed to do right now. We worry about our finances. Am I going to this and that? And I'm not saying we shouldn't plan and, and, and be responsible. I'm all for being responsible with our finances, but you know what I'm talking about. And we worry about problems. Someone said if you break down everybody's anxiety or, their, or the, what they worry about, 40% of it is on things that will never happen. 30% is about things about the past that can't be changed. 12% is about criticism received by others, mostly untrue. 10% is about health, and if you worry about your health, that just causes stress, which makes your health worse. And 80% is about real problems that we actually will face. We worry about what could happen in the situations of life that we're going through. It makes us feel uneasy. We worry about the things that could happen but haven't happened yet. By the way, that, that does affect your body. That does affect your health. Someone has said that worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. And that's what worry is like. It clouds our mind. It will muddy our future. But <clears throat> I have good news. God's desire for us tonight is that we don't worry. He wants us to experience joy. As we looked at a few verses earlier, last, uh, a couple weeks ago, I believe, or last week. Rejoice in the Lord always. Now, he's talking about not worrying, and, and Paul had all kinds of problems, but he's already told us, look at, let's just rejoice in the Lord regardless of what is going on. And then he's going to talk to us about worry. Why? Because worry will keep us from rejoicing in the Lord regardless of what is going on in our life. He wants us to experience peace, and we'll look at that tonight. As we look <clears throat> specifically at our text, we see that life is about choices. We can choose specifically about this, worry, this area of worry. We can choose whether or not we dwell on these negative things. Our choice tonight is this. We can either live a life that's always worrying about what could happen and what is going on, or we can live a life where we focus on God and we experience his peace. The choice is ours. I have found that people usually find what they are looking for. I heard a story. I'm not sure it's true. It's probably just a tale. But there was a, a grandfather and his, and his grandson sitting outside of a, a city many, many years ago. And they were just hanging out there. And here came a traveler from afar. 
And this traveler came up and he talked to the to old man. He goes, old man, he goes, I have come from a city where there's nothing but strife and turmoil and people do nothing but cause trouble. Am I going to find that here if I stay in this city? And the grandfather said, yep, you're going to find it if you come here. So he said, well, then I better continue on. And he took off. A while later, as they're sitting there, another man came. <clears throat> he came up to the <clears throat> grandfather and goes, I come from a town where people get along with each other and everybody's happy and joyful. If I come to your town, is that what I'm going to find here? The old man said, you most certainly will. And he's go, great. And he came on in. The grandson looked at him and said, grandfather, wait on. You told the one man said, are you going to find problems and people that cause trouble here? And he, you said yes. And then the other man said, am I going to be How can both be true? And the grandfather said, people usually find what they're looking for. You know, it's an old thing that pastor used to always say. If I have a problem with Bill, Tom, and Sally, the problem isn't Bill, Tom, and Sally. The problem is me. We tend to find what we're looking for. God wants us to find peace tonight. So we're going to look at that. We can either have peace or worry. But which we choose is rooted really in what we think of God. How we think about God will flavor what we find in life and what we think about. Worry is something that works against our joy and something Jesus talked about. In Matthew chapter 6, verse number 25, he said, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, not for your, yet for your body, what you shall put on is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment. You know what he's saying? He says, don't worry. When he's saying, don't take no thought, he's saying, don't worry about these things. You're worrying about things that, that you have no control over. <clears throat> and then he gives them the answer in verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. He just said, look, quit worrying about things that you have no control over. Just put me first in, my, in your life and go forward, and, you, and it shall be well. Now, as we look at the scripture tonight, I want you to see four declarations he gives us about the choice we will have, whether we will worry or whether we will experience peace. Four declarations. Here's the first one. First thing he tells us is what we shouldn't do. And he says that is worry. Verse 6, it says, be careful for nothing. Now, that doesn't mean be a kamikaze and be a nutcase and just go crazy. That's not the kind of careful it's talking about. The word careful there means to worry. <clears throat> One of the most tragic wastes of your mind, <clears throat> excuse me, is allow it to be filled with worry and negative thoughts. And by the way, some people, that's all they dwell on. And then they wonder why they are a negative person. They wonder why they see the bad in everything. It's because that's all they dwell on. And it's a waste of our time. Think of it this way. To worry is to have a mind that's divided between legitimate thoughts and destructive thoughts. But worry always starts in the mind. Now we're going to get to it next week when we get to chapter, verse 8 where he talks about the things we ought to dwell on. He tells us let's not, let's not have this worry going on on us, but let's, let's, let's get to the things we ought to be thinking on. And many times we've, we've talked here and we've looked at it in Romans. What we think about comes out in our life. What we allow to fill our mind shows itself in the way that we will live. But everything starts in the mind. Worry. He tells us that it's a command for us not to worry. He says, be careful for nothing. He says, just don't do it. It's, it's pretty simple. Now, there's always reasons for it. We'll look at some of the reasonings. But he just says, don't do it. That's a command. Sometimes we think about the middle. How can that be a command? You know, he gave us a command a couple verses earlier. Rejoice in the Lord. That's not a good suggestion. That's literally a command. How can you command someone to be joyful? Right? It's like your children get disciplined. They're crying. It's like, stop crying. Be happy. You know, you got to kind of throw that at them. But God says, I want you to be joyful. It says, don't worry. We shouldn't do it, although we have that bent to do it, just because simply God says don't do it. It's not an option. Worry is taking things in our own hands, by the way, which is futile. 
And worse yet, it's not trusting God. Spent the whole message this morning about faith and and trust in God. The closer we draw to God, the more trust we will have in him, but worry about the things of the future. Not only is it disobedient, disobedient to God, it's just not, it's not trusting him. We are to come to God with everything. He says, don't do it. Worry never leads to joy. So it's a command. He gives us the confines of it. He says, be, uh, be careful for nothing. That means here are the options we have to worry about. None. Just don't worry about anything. I mean, nothing. That's pretty all-encompassing. Okay? He doesn't say, these things you can worry about, but the other things, don't worry about it. He says we're not to worry about any single thing in our life. There are no exceptions. You know, everybody's always looking for exceptions, Right? And by the way, it's amazing how all people always think that they are the, the exception to every single rule, right? You put a sign up that says, don't do this, and people read it and say, well, that's for everybody but me. I mean, that rule's for other people. I'm different. You're, you're not, you're different. If you speed and you get, pulled, you get pulled over, you're getting a ticket. Well, don't they understand? I had a good reason why I was speeding. There's never a good reason. And God says there's no exceptions here. Don't worry about anything. So it's pretty clear that God does not want us to worry at all. So he tells us what we shouldn't do. Don't worry. Next, he's going to tell us what we should do. Pray. Don't you like it when God butts in? Be careful for nothing. But now he's going to help us out here. He's given us the command, and there's the confines. Now he's going to tell us what we should do. But in everything, not for everything, in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. You see, that's the antidote there. Whenever you're tempted to worry about something in the future, whenever you're tempted to worry about what could happen, God says, turn that around And turn it into a prayer request. Just bring it to him. Now, someone said we ought to to be thankful for everything that happens. He doesn't say for everything. What does he say? The key word there is in everything. Bring it to God. Whenever we're concerned, something is weighing on our mind, we have two options. We can let it continue to sit there and weigh in our mind. Or we could turn it around and say, Lord, this is bothering me. I want to bring this to you. But we like to hold on to it. We like to keep it to ourselves. But he says, don't do it. The answer is prayer. So often prayer is the last resort. But really God tells us prayer should be our first response. We like to hold on to things. Prayer is addressing God. It's coming to him with the things that could potentially cause us to fret and worry. Just bringing our needs before the Lord. In everything that's going on, we ought to be able to bring that before our God. And by the way, it's a privilege for us to bring, be able to come before God. Do you know, that's what Jesus Christ, one of the things Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross. Remember the Holy of Holies. The, 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 the only person that was allowed to go there was the high priest once a year. And what happened when Jesus died on the cross? That veil ripped. That was picturing that no longer did you need someone to go in there on your behalf once a year. You could now have free access to God at any time. And that includes coming to him for prayer. That's the whole premise if you read Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. He says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy, thank God for that, and find grace to help in time of need. He says we don't need anybody to come to God on our behalf. You can come directly to God anytime you have a need. But you know what we do? We just put it in our mind and we dwell on it. We worry about what's going on. And some people, we can just, and I have a, I have a propensity, I could do this if I'm not careful. We just find the negative in everything. Hey, everything's going well. Well, no, no, bad things are going to happen. It's just going to happen. We just can't stand prosperity. 
But that, that ought not be like that. Let's bring what bothers us before the Lord. Notice this prayer we have has three qualities. The first quality is supplication. That's really the action of prayer. It says, but with prayer and, suppl and supplication, that's an urgency. That's a persistence in prayer. That's how we pray. It's the picture of a subject coming before his master with a great need. How do we come before God? Listen, that, in, that, that, that energy you would have wasted worrying on it, you ought to come with that same energy before God and say, God, this is bothering By the way, don't hide it from God. If something's bothering you, just lay it out. Why would you waste that energy just holding on to it? Take that same energy and bring it before God and ask for his help. Let's not be half-hearted. You know, now I lay me down to sleep. Uh, I pray the Lord my soul to keep or whatever. That, that's half-hearted. That's real. That's not real. But when you have a need and you're, you're tempted, just bring it to God. Supplication. But I like this. He tells us to bring it prayer or supplication with thanksgiving. That's the attitude of prayer. The attitude for prayer is thankfulness. I like that little subtle word there, with. With means as you're coming to God with these needs, bring something with you. There ought to be something that tags along every time we come before God. You know what that is? That is thanksgiving. You know why we worry? Because we're so self-centered. Everything's about us. And we worry about the future because we're not trusting in God. And God's like, why don't you come with to me and bring your needs? But come with thanksgiving. Listen, every time you come with, before God, you ought to have something to be thankful for. You say, but... I'm really struggling with something. It's really bothering me. I can't think of anything to be grateful for. Thank God that you can come to him with a burden. Lord, I'm so grateful that you command me to bring this to you. I'm so grateful that when I have a need, you're there for me. And, and when I don't understand things, Lord, I can just simply come to you. Thank him for that. We're so negative. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18 says, In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And we talk about God's will. What does God want me to do with my life? What is God's will for my life? I don't know. But I know this. God's will is for you to be thankful. And that extends to prayer. Thankful. Thankfulness helps us see things from all of the perspectives that we need. Someone has said that we must be careful for nothing, prayerful for everything, it, prayerful for everything and thankful for anything. You thankful tonight? Thanksgiving is just right around the corner, and this just so happens to, to kind of tag along there. When you come before God, don't come whining. And I know sometimes we have burdens and heartaches, and it's hard for us to, to keep our emotions right. But try to come to God with thanksgiving, trusting him that he knows what is best, and he will do what is best. So we have that. And then the last thing is requesting. That's just asking of prayer. Let your request be made known. It's okay to ask God for things. When we come before God, let's be very, very specific. So often you come with God and there's something that's bothering you and it, it seems almost unspiritual to bring it, so what you do is you just kind of like set it off to the side, right? Like I'm just going to hammer through and I'm going to pray over my list. I'm not going to deal with this. Listen, do you, let me just tell you something about God that might just alter your mind here. He knows everything. That thing that you have that you're like, you know, you're just kind of like, I'm just going to set that to the side. I'm not going to really. God's like, that thing's right there. And God might be prompting you just to go ahead and bring it. Ask. Be very specific in what you're asking him for. Requests are specific. As a new Christian, uh, a man at, our, at the bookstore at our church gave me a book to read. And here it was. Prayer is asking by John R. Rice. That's what the word means. Ask. Make a request. Be specific. When you're talking to God, don't speak in generalities. You know, I'm just really worried right now. Tell him what you're worried, what you're tempted to be worried about. This is what's bothering me, Lord. Be very, very, very specific. I like this. In Hezekiah, this is kind of the kind of faith we ought to have when we come to God. Hezekiah, one of the kings, I forget who it is now. His mind escapes him. It's a real big name, the Assyrian king. He had beat all the Shennacherib. Yeah, thanks. He had beat all of these. He's, Shennacherib just going through, and he's taken down all of these kingdoms. And so now he comes to uh, Judah. 
And he comes here and he's coming against Jerusalem. And by the way, Jerusalem was very weak at that time, even though Hezekiah had kind of built it up because they had had some bad kings. They were in no position to take this guy on. So Hezekiah, now he did what he did. History tells us he did some very smart things to kind of make it harder for them. But he kind of closed up the city and the walls, and Shennacherib's guys are there, and they're talking, as we would say, they're talking trash. And all the people are concerned, and he gets this letter. I like what he does. And look at verse 19. Oh, I'm sorry, you're not there. I'll read it to you. 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 14. So Hezekiah is going to bring this to God. And verse 14, Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers. And he read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. I like that. He got the letter and he goes to prayer and he goes, look, Lord, I want you to read something. He puts a letter out and he goes, that's what I'm talking about right there. This guy, he didn't say talking trash, that wasn't there. Look what he's saying about you. Look what he's doing. God, do you see this? That's what I call being specific. Just bringing it to God. You know, he could have he, he left the letter back home and said, Lord, you know what he's doing. But he's like, I just, it was like a little visual aid. Like, here it is. Look at this. By the way, God responded. They didn't have to even fight, and God gave them the victory. But why don't we do that? Why don't we just bring it? Maybe it's not a letter, but let's just bring what we need to God. If we don't bring it to him, we're going to hold on to it ourselves. That's a problem. Thirdly, what will it accomplish when we do this, when we don't worry, when we bring our request to God, we pray, what will it accomplish? Peace. I like this, verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Now you're not worrying. God will give you a peace. Peace and worry will never coexist. So if we can get God's peace, worry will flee. Somebody has said that while the world goes to pieces, we can have peace. Why? Because we're seeing past what's going on in this world because we're seeing it, as he mentioned a, a, a couple lessons ago, we're citizens of heaven. We're seeing it from God's perspective. We're not going to let this bother us. What kind of peace is it? I want you to notice it's a genuine peace. It is the peace of God. It's the real deal. You ever got something and it's fake or it's phony? Every time our, our kids, I've had several of our kids go to Cambodia. No offense, Brother Adrian. They go to Cambodia on the, on, on the, on the missions trip, uh, and they come back, and I get all kinds of nice stuff. I got a nice Gucci bag. And it was Gucci. Like, how much did that cost you? Like 10 bucks. You know, I found out I, they did spell Gucci right. That was good. Um, it was a nice Gucci bag, but all the little stitching started coming apart. Uh, when we were at the couples retreat, we stopped, uh, went with our family, I think with Stephen. We, we walked into the Bose store over at, the, uh, at the, um, the outlet mall. So we just went over there with the ladies. We walked in the Bose. That's the nice speakers, right? <clears throat> you don't buy them because they're ridiculous. And there was like a little, a little Bluetooth speaker. I'm like, I have that one. And I went and looked at it. It's like three, over $300. By the way, it was on sale for $2.95. It was, and I'm like, I have that. Brother Bong brought me one from Cambodia. And every morning I turn my computer on, and I turn on the Bluetooth. This Cambodian voice says, Bluetooth connected. <laughs> I don't think she worked for Bose. Okay? <laughs> That's not genuine. It's not real. It looks like the real thing, but it's not. But when we have a peace that's not just something we work up because we have a positive mental outlook. We have the power of positive thinking. When we get something that's from God, it's the real deal. And he says, listen, if you are quit worrying and you just bring everything to me and you're thankful about what I'm doing, you'll have the peace of God. That's the real article. You know the little thing that says, no God, no peace, N-O? And then it says, if you know God, K-N-O-W, you know peace. We can have peace if we know God. John 14, 27, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We can have real peace if we get it from the Lord. How do we do that? It has to come from an understanding of God. It has to come from God. It has to be because we know him. 
The peace we would have, that peace of God is attached to God, and the only way we're going to have it is if we attach ourselves to him, then we will have his peace. Matthew Henry, the great commentator, said, Happy are those who have the Lord for their God, for they have a God that they, that they cannot be robbed of. Enemies may steal our goods, but not our God. You see, God's peace is real and legitimate, and so it lasts. Over the years, I've met many people that have been to our church that have met the Lord. They know the Lord. And as God works in their life and they change, they have, some of them I've met, they have such great spirits, such great attitudes. But on a negative note, I've seen a few of those people in their lives, they've got away from God. And you know what happens sometimes when they get away from God? That sweet spirit they used to have, that good attitude they used to have is gone. Because they were getting that from God. And by the way, I'm sure that would be true of any of us. Our outlook changes once we step away from God. But once we're close to him, we can have everything he has for us. You know what he has for us? He has great peace. It's genuine and it's also generous. The Bible says it passeth all understanding. It's beyond our ability to comprehend. And so often that peace is seen whenever there's a trial or, or, or something that comes your way that's negative. See, because peace can be had when everything's going well. But it's how you respond when things aren't going well that tell do you really have the peace of God. Uh, many, many years ago I heard a story. They, 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 they had uh, somebody, uh, they, they had a contest, a painting contest, and they gave the people a subject. It was like peace and tranquility. That was the subject. And they wanted someone to paint a picture that was the best picture to that by looking at the picture that would describe this peace and tranquility. And so, you know, you got all the, all the, you know, the nice picture of the beautiful mountain, the picture of the calm sea, and all these different things like that. But the one that won was a picture of a storm. And in the storm on this rocky cliff, there was inside of one of the little holes a picture of a bird calmly sheltered from the storm, just sitting there very peacefully. That really is what peace is. Peace comes in times when you'd be tempted not to have peace. It passes all understanding. You know, people will look at it and say, how can you act like that in that situation? Well, you go back to the last point because it's genuine. It's of God. It's not of ourselves. If it was of ourselves, it probably would fall apart when things aren't going well. I love this verse in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 and 4. It says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee says, if our mind is stayed, it's focused on God, and we're trusting in him, we will have a peace that is perfect. And lastly, the fourth declaration is this, what it will provide. What does that peace provide? Key, stability. Stability. Thou shalt keep, the, it's, he says, the peace that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Stability. The word keep there means to protect by a military guard. You know, keep the city safe. So you got the military garrison around there, uh, 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 making sure that everything is taken care of, everything is protected. God says he keeps our hearts and our minds when we have that peace. That means we do have stability. You say, how can you prove that? Just look at the man who God used to write it, Paul. Where's he writing this from? We already know where he's writing it from. He's writing it from prison, from a, from a, a, a not even prison, it's not even that good. He's writing it from a cell, very filthy. Paul had went through all kinds of problems, from persecution to health. You name it, Paul went through it. And yet, through it all, he's sitting here writing, I'm kept. My heart and my mind are stable. What does he mean stabilizing our heart? That's our emotions. Our emotions can be all over the map. Now, one day we think everything's wonderful. The next day, everything is horrible. We're so emotional. 
But when we attach ourselves to the Lord and we're not worrying, we're, we bring all of our problems to the Lord and he gives us that peace, our hearts just stay stable. Yes, the emotions try to get out of, out, out of kilter, but you know what? We can keep them under control. By the way, we, we're just too emotional. Christianity is just too emotional. Up and down. By the way, we, we put God on trial all too often. Well, things aren't going well. Obviously, God's not doing anything. Maybe God's trying to drive you to him. Maybe try, God's trying to get you to focus more on him. And in our mind, that is our thoughts. Because that's usually where it gets out of place. Let me ask you tonight, do you have a tendency to worry? If you look at your life and, and things start to maybe not go the way you want, what's your first reaction? Do you start meditating on it? Do you have trouble sleeping at night because there's a situation or something's going on and you just, you just dwell on it? And all of us at times have had something and we let it get to our minds. Why don't you let that be a prompt to bring it to God? Let's not worry. And God will give us peace. Let's all stand tonight, please, if we could.